on behalf of the family, I would like to welcome you all as we gather together and share our love and thanksgiving for the life and precious memory of Hazel Patricia Ruddle. Although we have gathered at this moment because of the circumstances that we are in in this unique way, I actually think that there's a part of Hazel that would be uh, impressed and appreciate the uniqueness of the event that goes slightly against the grain. Of course, there will be an opportunity for uh, the family at a different time to come together when the times have changed, uh, to be able to mourn and to uh, scatter her ashes. But in the meantime, we are going to take this opportunity to come together in this special way and remember a, a wonderful person, a compassionate and lively character, someone who is a faithful and loving wife, a loving mother and grandmother, and a devoted believer and follower of Jesus Christ. Today, we will give thanks for Hazel's life in the way that she would have desired, with her family, which she loved dearly, taking part, her church family that she belonged to, coming alongside, and her dear friends, with whom Hazel shared a journey of life with, taking another step by being here. We will celebrate Hazel for the person she has been, for the life she's lived and all that she continues to mean to each and every one of us. But we will also take the opportunity to join together and to pray and to surround the family during this difficult time with our love and prayers. Join with me as we pray. We thank you, Lord, that those words you gave to your disciples when you promised that I will always be with you. When in their moments of distress, Lord, when they were wondering what was happening, in their moment of grief, you assured them, Lord, with your peace, but Lord, with your presence. We thank you, Lord, that you are with us now as we gather to remember Hazel, as we come and celebrate her life. We know that you are walking alongside us. Speak through the words. May our hearts know that compassion and love of Jesus. In your precious name, amen. Thank you. 
to school at the down school in Bexhill and she was never one to go against authority but she would always challenge authority if they thought she thought they were wrong. On one occasion she was called from the classroom to go and see the headmistress immediately so off she goes she goes in and the headmistress is there with one of the teachers and she says Hazel Yesterday lunchtime, did you go into classroom seven and write a rude word on the board? And Hazel said, no, I didn't. Well, we think you did, she said, looking at the teacher said. And then she said, this teacher saw you come out the classroom lunchtime yesterday when the rude word was written. She said, I wasn't there this time, yes, it's lunchtime yesterday. Oh, said the headmistress, but the teacher says you are. Ask the teacher. The teacher says, yes, I saw her come out of there lunchtime yesterday. She said, no, I wasn't. I was with Mrs. Jones. She said, where? She said, I was in classroom 27. So the headmistress says, but the teacher says, you see, saw you coming out. And the teacher confirms, yeah, I saw her come out yesterday lunchtime. So Hazel said, well, I think Mrs. Jones ought to be called in to say whether I was with her or not. So the headmistress thought, yeah, well, that's a good idea. Got her secretary, this Mrs. Jones came in and said, was Hazel with you yesterday lunchtime? And the head teacher said, yes, she was. We were discussing something to do with sports day. Oh, so she turns to the teacher who had accused her and said, you saw her coming out yesterday lunchtime? Oh, oh, it might have been the day before. So, oh, all right then. So the headmistress says, all right, Hazel, you can go. So Hazel says, no. So then she says, why? She says, well, I'm waiting for an apology from the teacher who accused me. And she got her apology and left. And that is Hazel. She wouldn't go against authority, but if she thought authority was wrong, she would challenge it. And I don't think a lot changed in her life over that. This is a reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 16. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me, because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine, and that's why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Jesus went on to say, in a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. Just over 25 years ago, I um, met the Ruddell family. And then we, me and mum, we, we formed a relationship in the end. Uh, through the years, it was just one of those things that we seemed to connect, I think, because of the age difference. It wasn't a lot. She was more like a sister to me. And she was always there, being an ex-nurse, she was always there for any medical needs or advice you needed. She's always willing to give it and help you out. I mean, through the years, we, we rarely clicked. It was a case of, as time went on, we would know what each other were going to say. We'd finish the sentence off. I can't remember what mum used to call it, but something like that. 
she was she was a good listener she was always there with the tissue box if i needed it <laughs> and this is how we went on um can't really think there's so much to sort of say but not um oh yeah there's another thing with with her um ipad and the apple thingy she used to get frustrated with me because she couldn't work it and me being an android user couldn't work out the system and would rarely get annoyed with each other because we just couldn't work it out you know it, it's not bad for sort of like two weeks work which is all i was supposed to be there for 25 plus years later i was still with her and I helped her out. She helped me out very much so in more ways than one, financially. Um, as I say, just there to talk. When I was upset, she would always know when there was something wrong with me and she would get it out of me eventually and try and sort it out for me. On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross, where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down And I will cling to your rugged cross And exchange it someday to start as Hazel and I go back a long way. I first met Hazel when she brought her sons to Sunday school and we became firm friends. She was part of our fellowship group and one thing was certain, she knew and loved her saviour and on occasion she would lead the Bible study which was always well prepared and thought-provoking. To her, Trust and obey was all important, and she he even had a banner made with these words on her wall. 
she was always prepared to share her testimony with unbelievers and had a special prayer room in her home, which she spent many hours communing with God. Hazel was generous to a fault, to her family, friends and those in need, and would do all she could to help and support them, not only in words, but in actions. For example, buying Christian books and literature to give to people, visiting people in hospital, and generally showing care and kindness. I remember her driving me on several occasions to visit my husband in hospital. She was a Damien Hill driver and drove like a maniac, thinking nothing of doing a U-turn in the middle of the highway in spite of the hooting and tooting of the horns. Needless to say, I always sent up a prayer before getting into her car. With Hazel, there was no mask. She was very forthright and often said she needed to put a zip on her mouth. But I'm glad to say she didn't because you always knew where you stood with her. She often spoke of her family and was very proud of her grandchildren, never judging, but accepting them warts and all and advising them when necessary. The last few years, Hazel was often in a great deal of pain, but her faith sustained her. And when faced with all kinds of difficulties, sadness or anxiety, she would go into her prayer room and bring her concerns to the Lord. She used to say she would have lots of questions to ask the Lord when she sees him. Well, Hazel, he's answering them now. Many times she said she couldn't wait to go home to be with her Lord. She now has her wish and I shall miss her friendship and loyalty. God bless you, Hazel. I want to lead us now in a time of prayer as we want to lift up to the Lord, the family in particular, but also take an opportunity to pray uh, for us as well, who are friends and who have known Hazel. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we recognize that life itself is a precious and sometimes frail gift. But today, Lord, we want to give thanks for the life of Hazel in whose memory we are gathered. We want to thank you for all that endears her memory to us and for the ways in which our lives, our life has been enriched by what Hazel has said and done. But at this time, we particularly want to lift up the family to you. Her sons, Christopher and William. Daughter-in-laws, Claire, Katie, Louise. For the grandchildren, Simon Peter II. Partner, Chloe. Esther, Hannah and Joshua. For great-granddaughter, Maisie May. We pray, Lord, from the depths of our hearts that you surround them with your grace and love. We thank you for that promise that you bring comfort to those who mourn. We pray that you would be their strength, a refuge in this time of sorrow. We also thank you for that future hope that promises a time when there will be no more sorrow or death, mourning or weeping. But in the meantime, we pray that you would help all of us now, enable us to trust in you, to seek you in the difficult times. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This reading is taken from Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, at chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy and it does not boast, it is not proud. 
It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. There is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain. Faith, hope and love. But the greatest of these is love. myself and the whole family thank you for joining us for this live stream service today we really want to celebrate mum's life and to give thanks to god for her 
In trying to sum up Hazel Ruddle, she was a strong, independent-minded, generous-hearted woman. She was Bexhill through and through, and if she saw an authority figure, she'd like to be, to be looking for a way of questioning it, at very least, sometimes undermining it as well. So Hazel Patricia Driscoll was born at the Royal East Sussex Hospital in Hastings, and she grew up in St David's Avenue, Bexhill, where the family had run a taxi firm for generations. Her dad was a taxi driver. Her mum, Hetty, was an inspiration and support to her. Uh, mum went to school at the Down School in Bexhill. Uh, after spending some time at St Peter's, St Peter's Church, she came down to Beulah as a teenager and was baptised there as a believer and remained a, a, um, a member even when she moved away for a short time. Nursing was very important to her in her early years. She trained and kept in touch with that group of friends, with Beryl and Di and others. She always loved casualty. Loved the fact that she diagnosed things before the doctors on screen did. Very good diagnostic skills, Mum. She didn't always keep up to date with, uh, with treatments, but her diagnosis was spot on. Uh, we'd always ring Mum for medical opinions. She worked for a time for company as the nurse Beecham's, I think. Uh, when people were off sick, she would go and uh, get them back to work as quick as possible and, and just see what, uh, what, what treatments, what, what was wrong with them. Um, she also worked for a time in a hospice and that meant a lot to her too. Mum married Dad, Peter Ruddle, uh, the love of her life in 1968, again at Beulah, and he was in banking. And he always looked after Mum. He was not so happy about Mum working. I think it's another generation. He thought it was his job to look after her. And he was quite successful in his career and so was able to look after Mum well. Uh, she loved to travel to, to Spain. There's some lovely photos of Mum and Dad enjoying a holiday in Spain in their, in their youth. Um, honeymooning in, in North Devon, um, Linton and Lynmouth. I remember when we took her back there one day and she suddenly really remembered that it was where she'd been on honeymoon. Uh, she went to the USA and had friends over there in Australia, where she saw her childhood friend Georgie and Adrian, Adrian to, to the Canary Islands. Uh, they moved around a bit in Staplehurst in Kent, Crawley in East Sussex, we lived when we were small children, and in Hastings as well. At one point, there was serious talk of moving to Australia with ABN Bank, Dad's employer, but it, it never happened. We moved to live in Amsterdam for three years, but then came back to the UK. All this time, links were maintained with Bexhill, mainly because Mum's parents still lived here. And um, almost as though Bexhill was the anchor uh, that kept Mum in the storm. And one time Mum was left holding a patient in her nursing career and it did her back in. She always blamed her bad back on being left holding a patient on her own. And she had an operation on her back that went wrong. And it left her with a lot of pain ever since for, for a lot of her adult life and it was problematic to her. The pain could sometimes make her irritable and balancing her pain relief meds was, was difficult. She always meant well, but would sometimes use creative ways to find some relief from the pain. During our childhood, mum suffered a period of mental ill health followed by ME, and it meant that for a lot of our childhood, mum was incapacitated and it left a measure of instability in the family. Of that. Then 25 years ago, our oldest brother, Simon Peter, died suddenly, and uh, he was a heroin addict and had injected some prescription medication. Unfortunately, tragically, most people come through uh, periods of difficulty in their lives like that. Uh, but with Simon, unfortunately, it killed him. 
and his widow Claire gave birth to Simon Peter II uh, five days later. This tragic event and the death of her husband Peter five months later led to a, a dramatic change in mum's life. She really was really needed to bring up her grandson Simon and it forced her out of bed and stepping up to take on an active role in his upbringing. All this time she helped out uh, at the Tuesday tea talk, attending church when she could, but her back was always painful and mornings were difficult for her. But these uh, big changes, uh, all this time mum was living in uh, Amherst Road where she lived, after she settled there. She'd lived there for a long time. Mum loved to meet new people. She was always interested in people. She was exceptionally generous, maybe even to a fault. She would give away money and stuff to people uh, that she that she just met. Um, if she had it, it was to be shared, it's what she would say. She was generous with her children and grandchildren, definitely, but not just us. When we were younger, there were various people who would come and be part of our family for a while, sometimes because they were in some sort of trouble. Not always, though. Beryl came with, with, with Ian and Lisa, Di Lily uh, with her children, Angela with Mark and Sean, Cynthia with Alison and Catherine, Isabella and Mac with Joseph and the family, Claire who stayed and married Big Simon. Uh, Mum and Dad even fostered a couple of kids for a while whose names I've forgotten. Uh, she is godmother to many middle-aged people who grew up in and around Bexhill. Even in, in more modern days, Shabazz and Burns talk about her as grandma or about, uh, you know, and, and, and Roger as well, talk, in her diary it says that Roger's her, her, her adopted son, but she would be very close to people. They'd almost become part of the family, sometimes for a while, sometimes for longer periods. But it wasn't unknown for us to come home and find a homeless person sitting, having lunch at our kitchen table. Uh, and there are some special mentions that we need to make to really faithful friends who have put up with, with a lot with mum uh, and given a lot as well. They're closer than sisters really, Beryl and Jean have been friends for more than 50 years. And that's an amazing uh, tribute of, of friendship that they've given to mum. And, and Jane as well, who's been mum's carer and, and carer and she calls her a younger sister uh, for 25 years. Jane has, has knows, known Mum really well. We heard from Jane a few minutes ago. The point is that Mum was very generous with her time and her money. She has instilled that spirit of hospitality and generosity into us, we hope. Around six years ago, Mum had a fall in the night and lay on her hands for 12 hours. And they never worked well since then. And after a period of recuperation at Sandhurst Coho, she moved into a flat and she felt a bit isolated there because she'd lived so long in the centre of town where people could just pop in. But she had many friends, Paul Huggins, Jennifer Reese Larkin, Roger, Jane, Emma, B, Shabazz and his daughter. She was close to each as, well as uh, was her way. And uh, she was a generous hearted person and uh, a generous hearted person is never really isolated. So to sum her up, as I said at the beginning, mum is anti-authoritarian by default, generous and friendly. She is a Christian and has Bexhill in her blood. Uh, mum wrote poetry, which I didn't know until I was just looking up her little book. I'm just gonna end with a very brief little poem that mum wrote herself about faith, about what she called it, she called it basic belief. The lives that boast no need of faith have no foundation stone. Their minds can never be at ease, no matter where they roam. Without a knowledge sure and true that God is everywhere, a life in time of sorrow can be plunged into despair. There must be faith to bring the joy 
that we seek every day, the quiet understanding that brings peace at work or play. No one can build on shifting sand and hope then to survive. There must be deep foundations to keep your dream alive. Mum loved to play hard. She loved her family. Yeah, she loved nursing. And most of all, though, she would tell you she loved Jesus. And she knows that she is in heaven with him now. And I tell you, she's been waiting a while for it. And she is at peace with her Lord and would want to encourage all her friends um, to consider faith and God. I know that always, uh, she prayed for you all uh, often. And um, yeah, mum, we miss you. This reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter three. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one could see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born again when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned, already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. As the minister of Beulah Baptist Church, I've been asked to uh, share a few words as Hazel worshipped here. Uh, and um, today I wanted to wear a colourful tie, a pink tie, in memory of Hazel's changing hair colour and her vibrant character she would often make me smile on a Sunday morning uh, when you would see her coming down either with her purple or plum hair, uh, pink, and uh, I think at one time it was lime green. Uh, and uh, Hazel would send me messages. Uh, you know, she would uh, often watch things on the internet and we'd be exchanging different things and sometimes it would be good, sometimes it would be a bit strange. And sometimes there would be the odd phone call as well. And sometimes that would be difficult because she had her health struggles. But as has been mentioned, uh, Hazel was a really compassionate person. And one of the things that uh, I will always remember and hold with me uh, was she was always a person who gave me the time, the personal time and uh, the love. But she gave it in a way that had this particular look as well. 
Often I would uh, see her in the beginning of the service or, or at the end and she would just sit down here uh, at the front and she would uh, sort of stop and she'd just say, so how are you? And often it would come with the, the comment and she said, you know, I've got two sons who are in the ministry, I know, I know what it's like. But it wasn't just the look of, of knowing, it was the, the look of, of, of really asking. A look that stared you in the, the eye and, and just said, you know, I'm, I'm here, I'm supporting you, I, I love you. A look of genuine love and care coming right back. Sometimes people think that God is an overbearing manager rather than someone who genuinely loves and stares us in the face. Often we can think of a God who likes to punish us. And yet Hazel's favorite passage that we read at the beginning of this service uh, that comes from John chapter 3, it paints an entirely different picture. It begins with those words, for God so loved the world. And what that means is God is personally motivated for love, out of love for you and me, for God so loved us. And then it says he gave his only son, and that really lays out two clear statements. The Son here means Jesus, but it also means God in flesh. In other words, the God of the Bible is not like all other religions. From here we see that God comes to us. God stares at us in the face with that love and compassion. He comes to meet with us, to meet with humanity. And then it says, God gave. As we've been reflecting throughout this service, we see that Hazel poured out her life for others. And she would say that she wasn't the perfect person, but she gave out of love and compassion because God gave to her first. Her motivation was because of those words that God gave. Every other religion and most philosophies will tell you that to be just be a good person, do good things, and just, you know, if you just love other people enough, then heaven waits for you. But I always think that that leaves us stranded. How do you know good is good enough? How do you know if you are loving enough? And often we would try and work that out by going to extremes and say, well, I'm not as bad as those people or those over there, so I must be okay. But if we're all honest about our own lives, the things we've said, the things we've done. It would be very hard for any of us to sit here and say, we've never lied, we've never stolen, we've never cheated someone else, we've never said something uh, that has hurt someone else. And you might sit there and think, well, this just seems like an impossible task to leave, lead, lead a good life. Maybe that's only reserved for the special few. You know, God knows that we can never truly live up to that standard of being perfect enough to make things right. And so he came to us. He gave his life on the cross in our place. He lived the perfect life. He died the perfect death so that when God sees Jesus, he sees us. When we step into Jesus' life in faith and we receive all that he's done for us, and that love for us, God sees him and sees us as good. That means we experience forgiveness. Forgiveness for all the wrong things that we've done. A slate wiped clean. So rather than feeling stranded, we are accepted. Rather than wondering what's it all about, we know. We know that God is not punishing us. We know that God loves us. We know that God stares us in the face with that love and compassion. And that's for anyone. For whosoever believes in him, it's a free gift for anyone to just receive by faith. And a love like that is life-changing. It changed Hazel's life. It changed my life. It turns your world upside down. Because love and forgiveness begin to touch every area when we let it. I'm going to miss Hazel. I'm going to miss her asking after me. I'm going to miss that time given love and compassion. But you know what? 
I'm going to see it also. Because she was just mirroring what was in the cross. And so every time I glimpse and I come to the cross of Christ and I receive that look of love and compassion and forgiveness, I'll also be reminded of Hazel's time, her love and her look. Let's bow our heads and pray. I thank you, Heavenly Father, that you did come and meet with us. I thank you that you came and you looked humanity in the eye. You came and lived part of our life. You were tempted, you loved, you knew loss, you laughed. Lord, you know what it's like. And so we have you in a unique way who identifies with us in every way. And I thank you, Lord, that through that gift, through that way of identifying with you, Lord, we saw how to be loving and compassionate, to know true goodness, to know acceptance before God. And I thank you, Lord, in Hazel's life, she knew what it meant to be accepted by you, to be loved by you. And I pray that we, too, whether we've known you, whether we don't know you, that we would know that love and acceptance that comes from Jesus Christ. In your precious name, amen.
trouble seems so far away Now it looks as though they're here to stay Oh, I believe in yesterday Suddenly I'm not half the man I used to be There's a shadow hanging over me Oh, yesterday Something wrong now I long for yesterday Yesterday All my troubles seem so far away Now it looks as though they're here to stay Oh, I believe in yesterday Suddenly I'm not half the man I used to be there's a shadow hanging over me Oh, yesterday came suddenly Why she had to go, I don't know She wouldn't say I said something wrong Now I long for yesterday As we draw our time together as a close, let us finish with these words as a blessing. As we have celebrated all the love that was part of Hazel's life, may the power of God's love fill each one of us with the faith we need, the peace our minds and hearts desire, and the hope which leads us through good times and bad. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.